So when you decide on your S-Class and you want to pay $2,500 a month for a lease, you want the ultimate in color selection, which they do. You have about 10 different versions of silver and gray to choose from. And when you get on the interior, you get a little bit more excitement. You get a brown, you get a silver or a gray leather, you get a darker red leather, and of course this black, which is the most understated. But let's not talk about that anymore because you're going to do all that stuff on your own. What you're going to want to know is what it's like to live on the interior cabin. And what they've done here is they have updated this car from the previous generation to make the technology even more extreme, which means getting rid of almost all of the traditional physical controls for haptics and touch. The center screen is your command center and it is all touch dependent. And the right light with enough fingerprints, you can't see a goddamn thing on it. When you're using it, you start to nail down and go down into about 150 different submenus of things to, to learn how to use this. And in fact, this is probably the first car I've been in where you could probably use a week long class and how all of this stuff works. The problem with that is really They've made everything so complicated. They've left physical controls in some places and then removed it for touch controls. And there's just a hodgepodge of things going on here that is very, very frustrating to use. That is until you kind of drill down into the individual components. And that is where this car shines. Let's start with the best part about the S-Class, the seats and the technology behind the seats. When you go into the infotainment, there is a menu just for all of this. It's called comfort. And when you go into the comfort mode, you have a massage section if you opt for this. You can, adjust, you can do side bolsters, you can do the upper body, you can do heating and cooling, you could do air freshener that activates with music and a picture of an ocean. You can go just to a traditional massage where it doesn't turn on the seat heaters and all that. But the big feature here is when you go into the seat menu is seat kinetics. And what is that? It's an anti-fatigue setting that you combine, you can combine with the massage. It will adjust the lower cushion, the side cushion, and it will move your body around to reduce pressure points. But it also is active. So if the ECU detects steering wheel angle change, it will inflate your side bolster to cradle you while the suspension is also tipping the car the other way. So you have the minimal amount of fatigue possible. These seats come with an adjustable headrest and a cushion if you opt for it. And it's just, it's the best part about this car. When you're in the passenger seat or in the back, you're like, okay, now I understand why I'm paying over $100,000 here because it is one of the best seating configurations of any car on the planet. Now you can, you know, I can go into so many sub menus here and explain all this. And again, it would, it would make this video about 30 weeks long, but there's other things that they try to do here. They try to blanket you with luxury. And that extends into the Burmester audio system where you have individual control of 4D, 3D. You have vibration in the seats, which also combines with the massaging function. It feels like you're sitting on 10 different cell phones or one of your favorite vibrating toys. You can use that as well to augment the audio system. That's like that home theater idea where the bass is also turned into a vibration. And it, again, it's about surrounding you with all the latest technology. The screen or the displays, again, are another highlight. You have an OLED in the front. It, the, it just looks amazing. The 3D gauge cluster, you can turn on and off through the infotainment, but unlike what you saw in the Genesis implementation, it doesn't look like a Walmart knockoff. The, the 3D depth is incredible when you look at it and you have to be perfectly aligned and it will tell you that you have to see these six dots on the top of the display for it to work correctly. But when you're lined up with it, the depth of field, how it looks, how it interacts with you is amazing along with the AR, which is augmented reality. They've implemented certain things in how the navigation system works where you can see camera and arrows that know where you are on the road. It will show you the arrows and the screen at the same time. It combines that with the HUD, which is a chasm when you look at this, this HUD projection that's in front of you. Uh, it looks like you could store your keys in there or you know whatever you have, a bag of fast food. But overall, the technology, the mechanical technology is incredible in here. It's just the way that they've put it all together. And you can tell in design and implementation, they're like, 
give me all your ideas. Tell me everything you want to do. And you had all these engineers that are like, we want to do all this. And they're like, let's do it. And then when they put it all together, that's where it started to fall apart because it, it just, there's just so many different places, so many things that are distracting, so much interaction required with the center screen to do anything that you're just distracted constantly when you're driving, when you want to switch stuff. Now, you could make the argument that they set up these profiles, that when you log in as yourself, everything is catered to way, the way that you want it, and you're not going to have to mess with it. It's just, there's never a time where the technology is kind of like tuned out, and it's just you and the car, like some of the older S-classes in the past were. Now, obviously, if you're just driving it, this could be a problem. But if you're a passenger, again, like I said, that's the best part. The back seat, the back passenger side seat, will fully recline. It will massage. You have your own Samsung Android tablet in the back that controls the entire car, essentially. Ambient lighting, vibration, sound, the shades. You can basically do anything in the front as the back passenger. And when you recline back there, again, it is just, a, it transforms this car experience. And we're going to talk a little bit about in the shop how they made not only the comfort on the interior, how they combined it with all the mechanical engineering that went into the chassis. But we're going to head into the shop now. We're going to talk about all of that. Mark, we're underneath a Mercedes S-Class, and per usual with this brand, we are last to the party, we have no engineering support, and this is their most complicated flagship product that they spent a gajillion dollars on, and it's supposed to be the showcase piece for future technology, what the brand can achieve, and this is also, as you like to call it, a certain kind of vehicle for a certain kind of person. And who is that person, Mark? Uh, I'm not going to get into that because I don't want to offend anybody, but this is definitely a one percenter car. This is one of those cars that, while I appreciate all the work that went into it and all the engineering, it's the pinnacle of a beta machine. It's a throwaway car that when you look at resale values, tanks into oblivion because nobody wants this after three years when the tech is archaic and everything breaks and it costs too much to work on. And this is a, and we're talking about this in future videos, it's a perfect example of when engineering goes too far. They just do it because they have the money to do it and they're trying to throw 100 pounds of shit in a 10 pound bag. And while some of it is amazing, as you're going to detail, some of it is just there just to show off. And that's what this car really is to me, is it's, it's that car for somebody that has a lot of money, doesn't care about anything else other than, I just want the best on paper. And some of it is the best and some of it is absolute garbage. But let's, I'll leave it there. That's my, my diatribe. So... The highlights of this car, if you like vehicles and you like engineering, come from the underneath portion. Mark has already talked in length about the interior segment where I will argue with you at least a little bit that it is not particularly usable. And from a depreciation perspective, Mark, this is the kind of car for someone who pays someone else to worry about numbers. <laughs> right. This is not a car for you or I or anyone who is in the upper or lower middle class. This is for John Rich. But let's talk about this car. It is a redesign, it is all new for this generation, and the S-Class is the pinnacle of luxury for Mercedes. And you talk to any engineer, every other luxury car is the Walmart version of this when it comes to what they can achieve with their budget. This was unlimited money going into this product. Let's talk about the body first. The interior is designed after a yacht. It's supposed to feel like a luxury experience 24-7. The exterior is prioritizing aerodynamics and a strong presence. Aerodynamics for fuel economy, but more importantly, aerodynamics for the reduction of wind noise inside the cabin. So you have active everything in the front. The door handles retreat into the, into the actual door of the car. They have an interesting design in the rear window to reduce NVH or wind noise. But more importantly, the body structure, which is largely aluminum, more rigid than the prior generation car, but it's also one of the first vehicles to introduce basically sound deadening foam into the body cavities of the vehicle that as the car gets heated up, they expand to further reduce NVH and road noise. This is one of the quietest cars on the market and they can numerically prove that. Along with of course their uh, thermally insulated and soundproof glass and all that other fun stuff. When it comes to the suspension system in this car, it is a multi-link front end. It's essentially a double wishbone Every component around the wheel is a forged aluminum piece other than the actual wheel bearing itself, which is a standard wheel bearing. The rear is a multi-link, does not have an aluminum rear subframe, but again, like the front, every link is aluminum and forged. 
The big story is the shock control, or really the body control of this car. There are five microprocessors and 20 or more than 20 sensors built into the suspension system of this car. So each wheel will truly act independently from one another. The air shock and air spring has two chambers each and will change the spring rate corner to corner. So ideally, if you hit a bump with the front left wheel, the damping rate and the spring rate will change for all three other wheels and the front left wheel will then act independently. So none of that bump or vibration translates into the cabin. It also has a read ahead function, much like the prior generation Mercedes. So it's using the cameras in the front of the car to scan the road to look for dips. If it detects a dip, it will then preload or pre preset up the suspension to make sure that the wealthy occupant inside has no idea they hit a bump. It will read the road ahead as well to get the suspension to lean. So the suspension will lean the opposite direction you're turning in so it doesn't disturb the internal drivers or passengers to simulate something like you do on a motorcycle. It's an unbelievably complicated system. It also is a formatic system, it's an all-wheel drive system, but it has brake torque vectoring in the rear where if you turn in and it detects understeer, it'll brake either the right or left wheel accordingly to move that around. You have all the drive modes associated with it as well, which will stiffen up the suspension to get a little bit more body control and all that other fun stuff, but that's more typical in a car like this. The last thing I'm gonna talk about is the rear steer module. You have two- Which is optional. Which is optional, and you have two basically modes for the rear steer module. You have one that will only turn 4.5 degrees, and that's if you have the staggered AMG wheel set, or if you go for the luxury car set up, you get a 10 degree rear steer change, and it will change in either the direction the car is turning or not to simulate in either longer or shorter wheelbase, but day to day in a practical sense, it reduces the turning radius of this car by two meters, which is a lot, to it's be honest. It's optional, but you should, out of anything, you should opt for that because this is a long car and it does make a huge difference in how you park it, how you move it around. It doesn't feel like such a tank when you're using it day to day. Yeah. When it comes to safety, the last thing I'm gonna talk about is how the suspension system will actually aid you in an accident. One of the things this car will do, if it senses a side impact from either left or right, will raise either the left or right by eight centimeters to deflect the accident in the lower part of the car versus taking the impact entirely in the door. All of this technology Mercedes is promising they will start to filter into lower vehicles and that's why this is such a interesting car from that perspective. But with that, Mark, I think it's time for us to get onto the road. Sounds good, Jack. How's that massage treating you, Mark? Take me for a spin in a paradise. I'm late to my factory. Do you have the seat? The seat uh, kinematics or whatever the hell it is on? I do, Mark. You're getting a hot stone massage. We're going and how's your little little pillow treating my you? My little neck pillow, it's probably got more scabs and skin <laughs> from all the people that have driven this. I, this car, I'm just gonna get this out of the way. The highlight of this is being a passenger, either front or back. And obviously if you're in the back and you have the fully loaded car where you can fully recline, it is a remarkable experience. It's the benchmark and ride in isolation, even with winter tires. You barely hear the winter tread, like whir whirring sound. It, it's, it's The cars just passing you are louder than the tires. Yes. It's, it's a, a remarkably well-tuned suspension. You feel the suspension essentially uh, it's a fully active suspension, so it's constantly writing itself in lean, dive, squat. It's soft over everything. There's very minimal intrusion over any type of bump. This is the magic of this car and all the technology when it's new, of course. Yes. This is a disposable car, and what I mean by that is I would like to meet the person who bought this thing new and kept it for 10 years without a long-term warranty and see what has happened with this car as far as repair bills go. Because this car is all about here and now technology. And it's a huge like, mood killer for you and I've just accepted it with this vehicle. Well, for me, I look at cars much differently. And I, I, while I appreciate some of the technology that's in here because it really, it's some of this is groundbreaking. It's the best stuff in the world in any type of street car. At the same time, it's just, it's not well thought out. Things don't make any logical but you're sense. Not, this car is designed for someone like the Tesla crowd, right? Someone who's wowed by the, But the gimmicks. Tesla works. Fair. The technology is sorted out. They understand what they're doing there. This is just like somebody just swallowed all the tech and just vomited and diarrheated all over this car. And that's what makes it 
That's what pisses me off the most. No, we talked about that a lot, Jack. Yes. I, I think let's talk about kind of the drivetrain and the engine stuff because we didn't talk about that during so the So you job. have a couple options for the United States, but really the two that come to mind are this, the S580, which is the twin-turbo 4-liter V8. It's a variation of what you've seen from you know some of the other Mercedes products. This has the <coughs> EQ churn system, which means it doesn't have traditional parasitic losses. It has like an integrated electric motor in it to take over for the startup sequence and fill in some of the torque dip, which is, you know, it's very admirable. It makes a lot of power. It's more than fast enough to zero to 60 in the low fours. This is a very heavy vehicle at 4,800 pounds, and you never notice the weight. If you're doing really Autobahn speeds on the highway, over 80 miles an hour, there's always passing power. It returns reasonable-ish fuel economy. You're looking at mid-20s of the V8. You know, to get this with an inline six, which I wouldn't get. I'd get this as a V8. If you're buying this car, you are not penny pinching. At least in the U.S., you might as well go for the full-fledged engine. But who really cares? All this car is doing is for you to cruise in. If you aren't like Mark and you don't get frustrated by the technology, you're probably going to enjoy being in this. It rides really, really well. It is the best riding car it, it, I've been in. Yeah, it's a soft luxury cru cruiser. That's why I said, like, they've done some of the things that you have to, you really have to acknowledge how advanced this car is and how amazing it is being a benchmark luxury product. That's what I love about it. And that's why I said, if I'm sitting here or I'm sitting in the back, yeah. I, I really don't care about this shit. But as somebody, if you're driving this every day, that's where it starts to inundate you. So it's it's kind of a weird car. In but that you regard. feel nothing while you're driving. No, you, you don't. feel no emotional connection no, to this no. thing at all. And you're not supposed to. And it's the perfect luxury car in that regard, in terms of ride refinement, isolation, drivetrain balance. It's like the speed. polar opposite to the Panamera Turbo S. They're both cars that set out to achieve the market and rich man yeah, who yeah. wants to go fast on the highway. The Panamera feels like a sports car, but it rides like a luxury car. Yes. This. This doesn't, doesn't have any sporty pretensions. No. It's trying to to eliminate any type of feeling of turning. Like if you're turning, it's trying to counteract the turn, yes. not for grip or handling purposes, just, just so you don't feel it. You, just yeah. not, not to disturb my wine glass that I have here. <laughs> and there's a lot of like comedy that you could talk about with this car that we haven't. And it's hard for me to get <laughs> comedic when this this car is so serious. If you watch it, it, the marketing videos, like 23 minutes, yeah. it's the most seriously nauseating thing you've ever seen. Yeah, it, but, it's it's deadly serious, and the people who designed this were had no sense of humor at all. And I think it could use a little bit of that to to brighten up the fact that you're. This does not when when you look at certain parts of it, it doesn't feel like. I'm in a hundred and forty thousand dollar car. It feels like something that like Hyundai and Kia are trying to copy, but you know I'm I'm not going to say anything more than that, Jack. What else do you have to say before we get into the final thoughts? It's a very hard car to quantify, Mark. I think you know this is a vehicle that if you are in the market for something like this, you're just going to go out and buy it. Mm -hmm. No one's buying this for an aspirational purchase, so it's it's hard for you or I to do a really do any justice to this product or really give it a normal review, I think. I, I don't think that's true, man. I, I, you know, I understand what luxury cars are. I understand, like, the technology. It's not that I don't understand any of yeah. this. But it, I think it's a hard thing to, to show someone in a video, though, this level of ridiculousness that comes to a cabin or driving experience. It, if you had the money, $150,000, okay. I guess, you know, could you forgive the deficiencies in usability daily? And would you be okay with the fact that this is an amazing riding car and separate those but two But do you think anyone's really cross-shopping a car like this? No one who's looking at an LS, which is well, like 75 Well, not even just an LS. You look at the Audi products, the okay. upper-run Audi products. They do similar things, and their technology is, while overbearing, not nearly as frustrating as this. You have the Porsche products, which are well over $150,000, that give you a better balance of technology, ride, and handling. There are other cars that do this and may not have the ultimate soft ride, but to me, what do you want? Do you want like a better balance or do you want something like this where it's two extremes? Okay, I'll give you that. I mean, I I'm with you, right? There's no way in hell I would buy this over a Panamera Turbo or something along those lines. This car was not designed for me, but I'm trying to play devil's advocate and trying to understand who this vehicle is for because clearly Mercedes focus group this car to death. There is some desire for this technology. I've not met a person who's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but right, right. Clearly, they know who their market is. 
Okay. So I think, Mark, with that, it's time for us to head into the final flounce. Sounds good, Jack. Final thoughts on the S-Class. I'm gonna sum it up this way. It's like Mercedes was trying to create a futuristic Hollywood art house film. They were swinging for the fences trying to win an Oscar. They hired the best talent in the industry, the most proficient technical staff, the best actors, the best visual effects people. But they didn't spend enough time hashing out the story, making it cohesive. And what you're left with when you drive it or you experience this car is elements of being blown away by how talented some of these people are. But at the end, you feel more or less like it's a disposable car, something that is ultimately forgettable. And yes, I understand this car is for a very small sub subset of buyers that are only going to lease it. But what they should have done and what they can do here is they need to figure out how to use restraint and technology. The best tech solutions are those that seamlessly blend into the background that make your life better. And what they're trying to do is throw it at you and throw it at you. In fact, I feel like this is the first car I've been in where what they need is a experience mode selector like they do drive selectors. Something where you can turn it to zero and just have it kind of smoothly go away. And if you want bright lights and being blinded and distracted, you just turn that knob up to 10. And what this car really is, it's always at an eight or a 10. And unless you're a passenger, like I kept saying throughout this video, it just does not work. That said, there are some amazing world-class things here that I hope they carry into other cars. Thanks for watching. See you next time.